enhance scientific credibility can be used in governmental and policy contexts. I will pass it over now. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thanks, everybody. Um, I probably have to ask the obligatory question of, is it working? Any thumbs up? Yeah, it looks good to me. It's good. OK, great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so this it's great to follow um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nicolas and, uh, and Pacha, uh, uh, because uh, I also want to talk about reproducibility as it goes into, um, into government. And what I want to do today is um, kind of open a conversation that hopefully we can continue over the next years and kind of see, see who's interested in continuing this conversation. Um, I put my friend Kevin Wilson's name on this because I stole a bunch of his slides and he and I are, are having a constant discussion uh, um, about these about about this these questions and today I want to I'm going to talk a bit about tools and and be a bit more um, uh, uh, narrow and technical uh, than than the, the deeper think thought thinking that um, um, our, uh, you know that Pacha and Nicolas were were encouraging us to do but I'll, I'll, I'll start here. So I want to talk about, in particular, um, these kinds of institutions that are inside the government. They're 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 called policy labs. Um, they began in the in the UK. Um, actually, they've they've kind of existed back and forth between think tanks um, and 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 off and groups directly inside of the government. Um, there are research labs, for example. Well, there's I know that there's like one in Chile, um, as well. Um, and these these groups are their main goal is to connect academics into the policy process and to enhance uh, the use of better evidence based policy. Um, uh, these these are the three that I know best. I was a member of this one, um, and uh, uh, you know they you you have a group of academics from psychology and economics and many other disciplines who are kind of working on on providing rigorous evidence. That's that things that certain policy uh, uh, interventions work or not, and also they work on bringing in new ideas um, to um, uh, new, they, they want they want to basically bring bring new ideas to 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 the to the practice as well. Um, you know, so what would psychology recommend? What would economics recommend? The lab at DC is another such one. It's based in the mayor's office at DC, and now we're at Brown University, um, uh, where we're working with the state of Rhode Island, but also. Um, any any group in anywhere in the world, we can we can do work with them as well. Um, Kevin worked in the in the uh, the lab at DC. Okay, so that's just, these are the kind of organizations we're talking about. Um, so great, so well programmed this this session because of the follow up on think tanks. Lots to discuss. Really, the, what kind of organizations produce the evidence, and and what should we do with that? So um, to foreshadow my conclusions, I think that we need some new we, we need a sets of new tools and practices um, uh, in order to bring the promises of rep reproducibility into the into government. And again, this is not as the deeper questions of well, what if fake? I, this is assuming that everyone is trying to 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 not pursue a political agenda, but per, but assuming that people are going to try to actually like tell the truth. But it's that's still quite difficult. Um, so we're gonna. I want. I want to talk about. I kind of. I want to talk about the slide at the end, but I put it up at the beginning. Um, you know, there's lots of tools that have been discussed today, and I think we need some new tools. And Kevin and I keep discussing uh, uh, different kind, kinds of tools that we're running. We're running into problems uh, taking our, what we what we knew from academia into the world of uh, public policy. Okay. Um, so th these are. This is just a kind of a list of some things that I'm going to come down, come back to, but it seems to me like the tidy verse is not enough. Let's put it that way, for example. Um, also, in, in fact, you know, wanna, we want reproducibility because we want to minimize harm toward, toward ordinary people. And we could really, really make harm toward ordinary people if we, if we had error-ridden results. Um, uh, again, this is assuming that this is, this is just good faith, but yet, but yet errors, right? Um, so, so reproducibility becomes more important to us in some, some way or another. Um, so what I want to talk about first is kind of give you guys a little bit of a sense about what it means, what, what a project looks like, and then I can talk about where these tools might play a role. And then I'll end by saying we don't have the tools, and I'd love to get help 
thinking about are these the tools and what should we be doing next? So here's kind of a sense of, of, of the process that the governor says, hey, you know, um, we need to encourage people to get um, tested for COVID and people are, are, are not being tested or vaccinated, et cetera. What can we do? So we, we uh, gather a group together of um, human-centered designers and psychologists and econ economists um, together with the people who, are, who have been working with the public health agency for years, and we collaboratively generate new ideas about how we're going to change the messaging to, for different populations. Ideally, we will design uh, a, a, we will design an RCT, but we may in include um, human-centered design-based qualitative research into this as well. Um, we'll often simulate the design. Um, we will also now that we'll design and publish a pre-analysis plan um, on the OSF or on our website that with if it was the OES. Um, we will field the intervention and we'll use the simulations that we did using an R package called declare design often to randomize. Maybe we'll need to help draw a sample. Here we'll run into some, we, we begin to, you know, I, I didn't draw it here, but there are shifting groups of people throughout all of this. Here drawing the sample requires different people randomizing requires different people field the field intervention may require a copy shop to make 10,000 letters and to send them to, to the correct people we'll collect outcome data and we might like to add ad administrative outcomes like what is your testing result are you COVID positive um, we might want to add census data so that we know whether or not our new policy is inadvertently uh, um, um, disadvantaging people from different neighborhoods uh, we might need to clean the data. Here's a line of code that maybe I think Kevin wrote. If your mailer ID contains the word Nimrod, that's not a valid ma mailer ID. We also, we, at this point, we need to be protecting all of this data because these are, this is, these are addresses, these may be people's COVID testing results, for example, so we have to put it in a very spe specific place. No, uh, no Dropbox uh, for this. Uh, we have to be really, really careful about how, how we treat this data. In fact, we have a system you can't copy and paste text into this system. It's quite a, annoying to use Stack Overflow and uh, not be able to copy and paste. Now we want to analyze outcomes, but we can't, we've discovered we can't analyze the same outcomes because it turns out that the data that we received weren't the data we anticipated. So now we have to change our reanalysis plan, our analysis plan, but we'll try to do so as fast as we can, we'll produce plots, tables, numbers, write the report, et cetera. So that's kind of the, 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 the lifetime of a, uh, of, of a project. You, we, we, what you might notice is that there's lots of different groups of he, here from you know, the governor, let's go back, uh, at to, and, the, and, and, the, and uh, people, it, people in the public health agency to at all levels down here in this, in the, in the, uh, the example I was thinking of, um, we had the National Guard uh, volunteering to hand write uh, survey questions as people were being tested. The data is definitely sensitive. The teams are interacting constantly. There are so many meetings with so many different kinds of people, um, very rapid and decision oriented. So let's see about where, where reproducibility practices play a role? Well, we can definitely simulate our designs so that other people can see our power analyses and whether or not our confidence intervals have correct coverage. Um, that's great. And we can set seeds when we do that. And we can use open source tools. We can put that on GitHub, be public about that. And the analysis plans are also something that we can and do do quite, quite well. Um, similarly, you know, we can do, we can, it, we can ensure that we don't manipulate data by hand. Yeah, you know, no use, no taking two columns and two Excel spreadsheets and trying to connect them up um, or plots by hand in Excel, for example. It turns out, however, that when the teams are so diverse that they speak almost any language. I should have put Julia. We have somebody who wants to use Julia a lot now too. That's awesome, you know, but it, it, it's more the merrier, but we do have to figure out how to communicate how do I take how do I take an output from your SAS code and put it into my R code and hand it over to a Python code? You know, in an environment where I can't cut and paste anything. Now, he, we, 
However, some reproducibility practices break down. We write the report using Google Docs because we need lots of people who are not technical to collaborate with us. So um, this is, you know, Kevin's words, copy pasta starts. This is a copy pasta step where we copy and paste into Google Docs. It drives me out of my mind. Um, and then we can publish the paper, but we can never share share this data to the public. Nobody, there, if you wanted to reproduce our analyses, you'd have to come physically, well, physically now, you'd have to get the rights to access Brown's stronghold computer system. Or in the federal government, uh, you'd have to do something else, be willing to like Zoom with some federal employee and look over their shoulder while they typed commands or something like that. Okay. So, so you can see that we're, we brought from academia into this work a lot of the, the same practices and same tools that everybody's using in science, but we're trying to do something slightly different and, and, and we're running into a few problems. Once we started to think about it, we began to realize that a lot of these practices have really different kinds of, of roles. And I'm, and I'm gonna just articulate three, three, three practices and have three different kinds of questions that come up for me. In academia, pre-analysis plans we know are great. If, if you pre-register pre your analysis, then I know you, you can say, I know when you say your P is 0.01, it's P is 0.01. I know, I know what your false positive rate is, for example. And it kind of addresses the, the file drawer problem in that the world has a record of attempted or at least planned studies. It's not identical to solving the file drawer problem because um, we don't know what your was new, you plan to do the study at least. In the policy labs, it becomes even more important. On the one hand, if I if you if I do a, a, a study of um, of uh, police body camera wearing, um, depending on the results, um, uh, you may be very likely to dis to to uh, discount this evidence and say that that's just you know a proof that you are uh, you know uh, in the pay of the police or in the pay of the Black Lives Matter movement. So. If, you could, if we could get stakeholders in the room and say, we haven't seen the data yet, seen, seen the results, or even we haven't designed the experiment yet, what would be compelling to you a priori that might help us, in fact, make the evidence work the way we hope the evidence is working. Um, there's been a little effort on that. That's why I wrote the word Yoakum. He's the director of our lab and was at the lab at DC and did, did the body camera work. Um, the pre-analysis plans also force these interdisciplinary decisions about statistics. I can't tell you how many wonderful conversations we've had about, about multi-level models versus fixed effects. You know, So it's good to have that conversation because you may think you grew up, all of your authority figures have said one thing to you and somebody else's authority figures say something else, right? And, uh, we, but you're on a team and you have to make a decision in three days. So you have to make some kind of a decision. What, on what basis will you make those decisions? So we, I, in the rooms that I've been in, I've tried to argue against uh, arguments from authority, but in any case, we have good discussions. Finally, the pre-analysis plans, if they're always public, shows that we, we're never hiding our work. Every study we do, we declare that we're doing it um, and, and that we've done it and what our plans are so that people are don't charge us uh, 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 as as if we are as we're hiding work or maybe we found something we didn't want to we wanted to hide so again the pre-analysis plans become quite important and but we don't actually have formalized ways to involve the public in our work for example and i don't even know what would happen if we had a meeting of of black lives matter activists and uh, police activists in the same room to discuss analysis so i think that we'd have to think hard about how to think how to think through conflictual uh, a moment, you know, evidence about, about uh, you know, um, topics that have a lot of conflict. Um, now, in science, when we think about, about, about errors in code and things like that, you know, you know in the end, we, we think, well, he corrects the errors. We have peer review. We have public data now. Um, the, the publications I publish in, they force me to send me their code, and I learn that I haven't anticipated that Windows needs to reproduce my analyses or that you know red hat linux needs it to be different or or whatever so so you know in the academic side uh we if we make some errors they don't make that big of that they're not they're not tremendous in terms of their their consequences well 
they could be really bad for my career, but probably they'll be caught over time and and my in my career by then will be over if by the time anybody reads a paper that I wrote, for example, you know, that's that's like small comfort uh, among <laughs> academics, right? Now in policy labs, we have a different problem that people want to make a decision based on our evidence as fast as possible. The data cannot be publicly scrutinized and we have to move as fast as we can, right? So, and the errors can affect the whole populations. And the other thing is that the people who are reading our reports don't know to ask, you know, um, what did you do about those duplicate IDs? Did you run it twice using, what, what did you do with the person whose identify, ID number was Nimrod, right? You know, the governor doesn't want to see that. So, you know, what can we do? Um, it, we came from academia with wonderful IDEs like our studio or, you know, Jupiter Lab with chunks of code that we can play with and learn from and run it, but we can run them out of order. We could run the files out of order. When I pass off an output that's been geocoded from Python to an R, an R script that is doing some permutation inference or, you know, that would be hard for me to rewrite in Python. How can I make sure that they run in, in the right kind of order? So we are, we're, we, we've been running into this and Kevin and I have some ideas about using make files and we've cobbled together other some things, but it's not very clear, but we're very kind of worried about this. Um, uh, the Office of Evaluation Scientists, Sciences has, um, has independent groups within their group reanalyze every single study. So they just, they just spend a lot out of time, ensuring that every study gets reanalyzed um, uh, from scratch, basically. Um, finally, uh, the statistically inference is not really designed for robust and rapid decision making, right? I mean, you know, on the one hand, in Fisher's lady tasting tea, he might be trying to encouraging us to decide that the lady can actually truly distinguish the milk first versus the, the, the tea first. But actually, it's really just evidence in favor or against that claim. He'd probably say we have to have Miriam, I think that's what's her name, um, Muriel, Muriel, um, Dr. Muriel, you know, taste the tea again in between publishing like the 50 articles that she had, I think, already published by then. You know, so, so in a way, like our very tools don't, aren't, encourage us to kind of slowly gather consensus and accumulation, right? Even if they appear rigorous, they're really not meant to guide immediate decisions, right? So, you know, one question that has come up for me is whether we need to build the cost of errors into alpha or into priors or something along those lines. And the, the dilemma that we've had here is that when we've gone to policymakers and said, even things like, what's your minimally detectable effect? Like, below which effect is it not worth doing this study? They have trouble answering that, that question. So saying, if you made this kind of an error based on our study, what would be the cost of this? I think that's a whole other, yet even more difficult, let alone you know, um, eliciting prior. So it's a challenge in a way, like how to use these tools in a way to, to, uh, to, uh, to appropriately help people uh, you know, learn what they're doing. Finally, the other issue here about robustness that I've come up with that I've thought about is about monitoring. So we tell them, tell you that something works, small class sizes improve, uh, you know, student outcomes, we might say, we might discover that using an RCT in Tennessee as they did. But uh, you might also, you might, what you might discover is that uh, small class sizes don't help very much if all of your teachers are, are absent or all your teachers are new um, so how, how do we know when we say something has, has worked if the context for the causal mechanism that's actually making the thing work is continuing to, to hold? We have the same problem in, in the data science side of things when we're, we try to predict when students are going to drop out of high school, but then COVID comes, the covariate to outcome relationships change suddenly. And, and now we can imagine, we can say, here's COVID, let's look back at all of our predictive, mo predictive models. But... What if there's a more subtle kinds of things changing in the world that, are, that aren't letting us know those things? And those, these are other questions we have too, like monitoring, follow-up. Um, those are questions we have. So now I hope that I've justified for you why I'd like to see some more tools for participatory 
participatory pre-analysis planning, maybe for blind reanalyses like you know Kaggle, like what if what if citizens could reanalyze my data, or what if there were great tools for unit testing of data ta tasks, like uh, like a snotty version of R that said before if you type ggplot without running a unit test, it would complain to you, or something like that. Um, better build systems that are that 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 realize that we're diverse and that we have diverse tasks. So, so Py, only Python oriented or only R oriented build systems can't work for us. Um, um, I had the automated data cleaning. You know, probably we should never forget to ask whether our, there are duplicate IDs. There, there, there's probably a series of things that we should be doing to, to ensure that we aren't making errors that again in the in lab setting so academic lab we're not we, we're, it's not common finally a big hang up for us is is collaborative writing um, in ways that with with non-technical audience um, and avoiding the copy and paste errors that may that may uh, you know sneak in and we haven't figured that out, out yet either um, so those are these are some of the ideas that I've, I've put up and I've shared the slides because I know I talked fast. Um, and I'd love to, to, to have further conversation about, about all of these uh, topics with, with, with any of you. So um, again, I put the PDF in, so you don't even have to scramble to write down my uh, 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 email address. I'm there. So, and Should there's I, some more. That I, we're not so alone. Yes, sure. Uh, thanks so much. That was just, um, just wonderful. Um, my wife actually worked with um, Kevin uh for for uh, for a summer or something like that he's uh just the smartest uh, little cookie isn't he um do, we've got a couple of minutes um does anyone have any questions that they wanted to to ask um oh there we go monica's just saying that kevin taught her everything that she knows about coding um good coding uh monica also asked um are there any jobs going at um at policy lab so <laughs> there's uh, always yeah well and also uh, uh, does anyone have office? any serious questions before yeah, i sure. before i ruin this this wonderful talk um, uh patrick well, there, um would you patrick says would you consider modern tool training as mandatory to join public offices for instance make or github actions or tech stuff you don't learn at college uh, yeah, I mean, I think that 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 to join at, at the tech level, at the as an analytic level, then you absolutely need to have some 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 of these abilities. Um, the idea of version control, the idea of using some of these one of these open source tools. I mean, we found that Python and R are a combination because in Python R was written by statisticians to do statistics, right, and so. The Cochrane Mantle Hansel test, it's nicely done there. If you want to do permutations, it's there. Right. I don't and, and it's been there for years. And I don't want to have to rewrite it in Python. Kevin could re easily rewrite it in Python, but it would take him, it would distract him. Whereas Python is so great for geocoding tons of addresses or, you know, doing other many, many other sorts of things. So it's kind of a multi-tool world out there uh, in terms of in terms of analytics. Sylvia, did you put your video on to ask a question or just to, no, okay. Just to ask. Amy, did you have any questions? One more minute. Uh, I think this stuff is fascinating and I would really um, appreciate the opportunity to like just keep going and follow what you're doing. And if we can try and um, support that that would be great as well um but it's it's fascin fascinating yeah. and deeply needed um, work that's great well i'm super excited to continue the, dis the discussion and i'm so glad you gathered all these people who with shared interests so that we can kind of like unveil ourselves to each other and therefore you know have these kind of conversations going forward yeah exactly thanks so much for your presentation oh uh, i really appreciate it uh uh next presenter is uh 
Amber Simpson. I, I think Amber's uh, running around oh, between my gosh. meetings. I have a very bright room. Do you, do you need another minute? I can, I can oh, do a long go. introduction. <laughs> if I put my head right in front of the sun, it'll be okay. I just have to. You look here. like one of these uh, Renaissance um, for the whole talk. Paintings. <laughs> I, I do. I look. I look angelic. Quite right. Yes. Uh, so Amber <laughs> is Canada Research Chair in Biomedical Computing and Informatics and is a professor uh, in School of Computing and also and also Biomedical and Molecular Sciences um, at Queen's. Queen's. Um, she's got a PhD in, in Computer Science and very much uh, focuses on, on this quantitative imaging. Uh, so uh, I might uh, hand it over to you, Amber. I'm uh, really interested in your talk. Thanks so much for agreeing to talk. 